Welcome to the Colby Cast, episode 134. Thank you for joining us. Today, Bonnie and I are joined by Colby dad, Chris Rank. Chris joins us to talk about ham radio, sharing how he and his son have found this hobby to be a great source of learning as a family and an opportunity to engage in a larger community. We also touch on our patron, St. Maximilian Colby, and whether he might have been a ham radio operator. We hope that you'll enjoy the show. Hi there, I'm Bonnie, liturgical musician, popcorn and podcast fanatic, and Colby homeschooling mom to four lads and lasses of middle and high school age. And this is Stephen, homeschooling father of five and director of development for Colby Academy. Morning, Stephen. How's it going? Morning, Bonnie. It's going well. Good, good. What comes to mind when I say ham radio? That's an interesting question, and (laughs) I probably would have had a different answer, except last night I was talking to one of my close friends, and he said that he had just become a technician for, or got his license or, or became registered or whatever. So so for me, it makes me think of my friend right now and that he's just uh, interested in all sorts of different things and picked it up. Okay. Well, that's good timing because our guest today is a Colby dad with a detailed and storied explanation of the medium. Chris Rank, hello, and welcome to the Colby cast. Well, hello, and thanks for having me here today. Um, I think a lot of people, when they think of what ham radio is, um, your experience may have been your father or an uncle or a grandfather or somebody sitting in a basement with uh, a very large old radio listening to somebody talking in a very scratchy uh, voice over, you know, distance. Um, But ham radio isn't what it used to be. Um, The radios are much smaller, they're portable now, and it's a... uh, more of an outdoor activity than it was before. People are taking radios to parks and they're taking them to mountains and and talking to people in those places. And it's much more of a uh, inclusive thing than it used to be. It used to be just a singular person sitting in a room trying to make a contact. And now you can take your whole family with you, which is kind of what I'd like to talk about today. Um, I'm a homeschool dad. I have a son who has his license and I would hope to encourage other Colby families listening to this, if they're interested in math and science and doing something as a hobby together as a family, that they might want to explore getting into ham radio as well. I'm excited. I think this is going to be a fascinating conversation. How does one ham radio operator greet another? Um, Usually you greet each other with your call sign. Um, okay. You say whatever my call sign is K3DCR. Um, so I, you know, say hello. This is K3DCR, and the other person on the other end would say hello. This is so and so. You can tell who you're talking to or where they're from by their call sign. North American call signs all have certain letters that they begin with. If I hear somebody begin their call sign with the letter V, I know they're from Canada. If I hear it start with an M. They're probably from England or Wales or somewhere like that. If it starts with a D, they're probably from Germany. So you already start to pick up all sorts of neat little nuances in the uh, in the lingo. Oh, that's very interesting. We were just talking before we started recording, and and you told us you were you also have experience in public radio and as well as in ham radio. Will you tell us a bit about that? Sure. Um, well, I have been with a public radio station for uh, a couple of years. Um, now I'm basically what's called a radio engineer. I help out with the transmitters and the feed lines and the antennas and all that kind of stuff. But um, my engineer one day sat down with me and he said, hey, have you ever gotten into ham radio? I said, I don't know. I don't really know anything about ham radio. And I started exploring it and I really enjoyed it. Um, I got my technician license. And then a couple of min- months later, I moved up to the second level, which is a general license. And then the, a couple of months later after that, I got the final license you can get, the extra license, which is about as good as you can get. Um, and I started doing it. And of course, I have a you know now an 11-year-old, and I encouraged him to get his license too. I said, well, you know, why don't you try to get your tech license and see what happens? He got his tech license. It took him two tries to get it, but you know, no big deal. If you Mm -hmm. take the test and you fail it, just take it again. No big deal. No shame. And then he has been participating in uh, things called nets, um, where we agree to meet at a certain frequency at a certain time, and we'll all check in and we'll see how everybody's going. You know, everybody gives their call sign and you just tell about your day or tell about your week. 
Now, when he first started, he didn't really have too much to say. You know, all the other hams were talking about their radios and their jobs and things like that. So one of the operators came up with a great idea. She said, well, why don't you have them tell a joke every week? So every Monday night at nine o'clock, we meet on a local frequency. Uh, the hams all meet. And one of the things that my son does is he tells a joke. And it's actually become a popular little thing. So everybody always tunes in every Monday night to hear his awful you know, joke, which is a <laughs> lot of fun. And he gets a kick out of it too. So, And that's good for him because it's, it's good. Uh, it's good experience working a radio. It's good experience talking, and it's also a nice little uh, niche that he can have. Mm -hmm. Definitely, there are plenty of ways to run with that ham term, aren't there? Yes, yes. <laughs> In our prep for this episode, you, you seem to make free and happy use of that term, and it seems that seems to kind of one of the ways being <laughs> yep. the this uh, niche he's carved for himself. That's great. And you said you're a Colby dad. How long have you all been with Colby? Well, you know, this is an interesting story. Uh, we have been with Colby now for two years. He's in his sixth grade year. Uh, we started with fifth grade. Okay. We were, um, when the uh, pandemic started, we went through one year of online school with the public school. And then we were beginning the second year of it. And we just thought, you know, I'm not really comfortable with this anymore. I'm really not thrilled with, with online school. So my wife and I um, were looking around for homeschooling, which was something that we had been wanting to do for a long time. So this kind of was the push that got us there. And it happens to be that we decided we wanted to be homeschooling families around August 14th, which happens to be the feast day of St. Maximilian Colby. Yeah. Um, and that was kind of interesting. And about two days later, I realized, oh, wait a minute, he is the patron saint of ham radio operators. That's kind of neat. Yeah. Um, and then about a week or two after that, I discovered an interesting net that happens on the radio called the St. Maximilian Colby net, um, which is every Sunday night at seven o'clock, uh, a bunch of ham radio, Catholic ham radio operators from all over the, the country. We meet and we talk about the life of St. Maximilian Colby and we talk about what he did. And we also just, you know, have some fellowship and just talk about what's going on in our lives and things that might be interesting and somebody might bring up what's happening in his parish or what, uh, what, you know, what feast days are coming up, things that we should be aware of. It's a really nice way for us to just stay in touch. So all of these things sort of happened at once. And uh, I kind of sat down and thought, well, that's, that's kind of interesting, <laughs> you know, <laughs> providential, I guess. There's lots of interesting things coming together already for me here as far as, I mean, I guess I've always thought about the, well, it seems that the ham radio people have a, a passion for the ham radio, but also mm -hmm. for the community that's there. And, it, and when you bring in St. Maximilian Colby and you just think about how how critical it is for as Catholics to reach out, you know, to, to form a community, to be part of, of things now, you know, especially when you're talking about the pandemic and everybody's working at home and we, we, we kind of, it's, it's the opposite of that. It's all kind of a turning inward, but it seems like the ham radio experience is a way to, to go out into the world and to meet new people. And yeah, and well, that's one of the things that I appreciate about it is that, uh, you know, most ham radios, frankly, tend to be, most operators tend to be a little bit older. But, you know, with the Colby net and with our local uh, with our local nets, um, there's a lot of people checking in and on each other. You know, oh, I haven't heard from this operator in, I don't know, three or four weeks. Somebody go to his house and see if he's OK, that kind of thing. So it's very much a, a community looking out for each other. And it was very critical during the pandemic that, you know, some of these people, if you're a less than mobile person or you're a shut in or you happen to be in an assisted living uh, out unit, having ham radio was a great way for you to stay in touch and be, you know, it's not ideal, but it's better than no human communication at all. Mm -hmm. So. Well, I have a cursory understanding of what ham radio is. Would you explain to us the basic principles of the medium and share with us some of the lingo that operators and enthusiasts use? Sure. Um, well, again, ham radio comes in basically two flavors. Um, there's what's called VHF and UHF. Those are the local repeaters. Um, you were talking on little handheld radios. Um, most of these radios have 
you know, a very short range, a couple miles. So for us to be able to talk to each other, we have a network of what's called repeaters. Uh, the repeaters are basically they retransmit your um, signal farther out. So with a small little handheld radio, you can talk to people 20 to 30 miles away. Okay. And again, it's a, a nice uh, tight knit community where we all check in on each other. People talk about their day. They talk about, you know, um, Hey, I saw an accident on this road. Yeah. I might want to avoid that. Um, there's a service element of ham radio where you can work for, um, emergency services and you can be sort of auxiliary help. Now you're not going out and arresting anybody, but if there's a natural disaster in your area, you may want to go out with your ham radio group and say, Hey, on this part of town, there's a power line down. And on this part of town, there's a tree down. And that frees up the uh, emergency services people to concentrate on more important things. My local ham radio group is coming up in uh, February, we're going to be helping out with a 5k run, which is going to be in a wooded part of the peninsula where we don't have a lot of cell phone coverage. So we're going to have members of the club stationed every couple miles along the road with our radios and we'll check in just so everybody is safe. If anybody's injured, we can call in and say, Hey, you know, we need somebody to get a, you know, car out here and pick up so-and-so. And that kind of thing helps out a lot for, uh, the community. So we're happy with that. So ham refers then to the amateur rather than um, professional, yes. commercial broadcasting or public safety, it, although you guys can collaborate with them in this way you're yes. describing or um, like maritime or aviation, public transportation, those mm -hmm. kinds of uses, right? Okay. I assume that the licensing is required just to make sure you're not getting into frequencies that would disrupt other things or is, that, is there other? Yes. The license is required for a couple of different reasons. One so you know the rules of the road. You're going to have more fun doing amateur radio if you know where you're supposed to transmit and where you're not supposed to transmit so you don't get in trouble with the FCC. Uh, there's a couple of questions on the test about safety. Uh, you are working with um, electricity. Um, you know, you are hooking your radio up to a power supply. You want to make sure you're safe doing that kind of stuff. And you want to have good operating uh, procedures so that everybody gets along and we all have a chance to talk and things like that. So... Yes, you do want to be licensed. It You can own all the ham radio equipment you want without a license and you can listen in, but you can't transmit unless you have a license legally. I think you mentioned people, you know, connecting all over the world here. So for me, with a bit of a engineering background, that that electromagnetic radiation idea is really intriguing and the, some of the science going on. And uh, would you be able to kind of share a little bit for... Sure. Okay. So remember I was saying there's two flavors of eight, of, uh, of ham radio. There's the VHF and UHF stuff. Those are the handhelds. And then there's what's called HF. Those are the big radios where you talk to Germany and Brazil and China and Australia. That's the magic of ham radio. First of all, there's something very exciting about hearing somebody from really, really far away. And what you're hearing is through all the science, you're hearing the uh, the radio waves bounce off the ionosphere and come down to you. So, you know, with a, a radio and only 20 watts of energy, you may be talking to somebody in South Africa or in Korea or in, uh, you know, Russia or wherever. It's really, really neat to do that. That's the, a very magical thing to hear that. So HF radio involves knowing a lot about uh, how radio waves propagate and which frequencies propagate better at certain times. Uh, there may be afternoons where you can hear things really well and then other afternoons where you can't hear anything very well. Or you may have noticed that AM radio, if you turn on an AM radio at night, you can get stations from much farther away than you can during the day. Well, the same thing is true of HF radio. If you're awake at uh, midnight, you can pick up stations from much, much farther away than you can during the day. All of those kind of things, you sort of have to learn the science or else you'll be frustrated thinking like, well, geez, why am I not hearing anybody? Well, because here's why it's two o'clock in the afternoon. You have to wait till later or you are on a frequency that doesn't have as much range as another frequency. What I like about this in homeschooling is that it's practical applications of really abstract ideas. It's very sometimes hard to wrap your brain around what's going on with all these frequencies. But if it's a practical problem of, 
hmm, I wish I could have more range on my radio. Then you can sort of learn these abstract ideas and apply them in ways that make a heck of a lot more sense. Especially t today, I always think I always think waves or electromagnetic radiation is just so intriguing in today's world because you know we always have our cell phones and we've got our Wi-Fi and mm -hmm. you know we're moving away from AM FM radio. But I was always kind of intrigued by before I knew any of the science, like why is the FM radio so clear but in a short range, and then AM radio we pull into a gas station and I can't hear the AM radio anymore at all. And to, to say, well, okay, well, AM, the wavelengths are so huge that they don't actually kind of fit under the, the covering mm -hmm. at, a, at a, and so I'm assuming ham radio, those, those, the H uses a really long, really big wavelengths to. Yes. Yes, they do. And again, it's, um, it's learning about those kind of things about which frequencies work better in which conditions and which wavelengths work better in which conditions helps you apply it to other things as well. You know, um, your over the air TV stations are VHF, UHF, they are line of sight. So if you're ever wondering, geez, why can't I pick up a station that's over a TV station that's over 70 miles away? That's why after 70 miles, you hit the curvature of the earth and you're just not going to pick stations up. But if you put your antenna higher and higher and higher, then you can defeat that a little bit. So it helps you to understand those kind of concepts. Why can I get local stations, but I can't get stations from the next day over? I hadn't really thought about the short wave, the line of sight things too. And um, But again, my friend who just got his technician license was pointing out that you know, the the wavelengths are too short, too intense to bounce off the ionosphere mm -hmm. as well. So they just shoot through because yes, of that exactly. rather than that's really I hadn't thought about that. Even you know, I was like, I should have, but it's really fun to, that you can you can think about some of those things in this in in the ham radio sphere. So imagine explaining that to um a twelve year old child or a ten year old child or an eight year old child or a fifteen year old kid. Um that's I think getting back to homeschooling, that's the benefit of having ham radio in the homeschool. The science and math that you have to understand, they have a practical application when you're when you're learning ham radio. There's so many other benefits of ham radio and homeschooling that I found. Um, for example, there's learning about geography. It's a lot of fun to put that big map up on your wall and put the pins in when you make contacts with people around the world. Uh, we've been using a I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but there's a digital mode called FT8, where instead of talking on the radio, you're using your computer to send some modulated frequencies around the world. What's neat about it is you don't need a lot of power. So um, you don't have to have 300 watts out. You can just have five or 10 watts out and still make contact with people in Australia and you know Japan. What's neat about that is, um, along with that software, some other little computer programs that will give you a map of the world and show you immediately all the locations that you're making contact with. So my son has it on uh, a little Raspberry Pi computer, and he'll sit there and make, uh, last week he made contact with India. So that was really neat. Um, he sent out his call sign, somebody in India sent out a signal report, which basically just means, how well am I hearing you? And then that person sent his call sign back and Walker sent him a, a signal report and that gets logged as a full contact. But having those little maps of where's Croatia, where is Macedonia, where is, you know, Ireland or where is South America or where is Argentina, all those little dots on the map, it's it makes those things concrete, which is a lot of fun. Yeah. Plus, there's the aspect of public speaking as well. Uh, like I said, he talks on the VHF net on Monday nights and tells a joke, which is good for his confidence. You know, he also does his own net. Uh, my son has a net on Thursday nights on, again, a local repeater. And in that net, he's what's called the net control. He's the person who's running the net. So he calls for check-ins and he has to listen carefully, sometimes through some heavy static to the people around the area. He writes down the call signs that called in and then I'll ask him a question. Um, usually it's something fun, like what's your favorite side dish at Thanksgiving or for Halloween, he, uh, asks, what was your favorite costume as a kid? You know, which of course all the hams love because they love to talk about themselves, you know, oh, back in 1962, I was, a, you know, 
So it's it's a conversational thing. It builds up your ability to both listen and to speak clearly and fluently. So that's another hidden benefit. I think sometimes we sort of overemphasize the science and math, which was one of the things I want to make clear to to uh, families listening is that you don't have to be a science genius or a math genius. Um, I was a philosophy major. <laughs> so, you know, math and science are not really my wheelhouse, but um, if I can pass the test and, and basically understand the concepts, then anybody can do it. For kids, there is no limit, age limit for uh, getting a license. So um, as long as they can pass a test, they can have a license. Uh, you may have a precocious eight-year-old who really wants to do it, or you might have a teenager who wants to do it. As long as they can pass that test, they can have that license. It sounds like there's some immediate practical sort of things as far as schooling. There's the great sort of connections. And I was thinking, okay, so if our listeners here are wondering, well, but why do this instead of, you know, just get on some sort of internet thing and communicate with a bunch of other people? Well, there's a there's a couple of reasons. First of all, I think it's good for kids to have hobbies in the first place, uh, whether it's gardening or painting or music or ham radio. It's good to have hobbies. And it's also good to have a hobby that you share as a family. Um, I like the fact that I'm not the authority sometimes when we're doing ham radio. Uh, my son might ask me a question and I don't know the answer. So we'll both go together and, and find out what the answer is. Uh, he asked me the other day some crazy questions. Well, most antennas are made out of wires. They're long wires strung out. Why can't you have an antenna that would be a hollow sphere? I said, you know, I don't know. I've never seen an antenna like that, but let's go find out the answer. So it gives you an example of, of a way to explore learning as a family together. Yeah. So there's there's that. You can explore learning it together as a family and you can share knowledge and share the learning process together as a family. There's not that many opportunities. Why ham radio as opposed to other things? We have these things in our pockets, these cell phones that we use all the time, but do we really know how they work and do we really appreciate how they work? There's so much technology that we have in our life that we don't really have the opportunity to crack the hood and tinker with very much anymore. Um, in ham radio, you can make kits, you can build your own little radios. So if you have a son or daughter who's very interested in um, putting things together and learning soldering and all that kind of stuff, imagine how nice it is to have your own little radio that you put together. And there's a sense of accomplishment right there. I've made contacts on my own radio. Mm -hmm. It used to be back in the 50s and 60s and 70s, you could take an engine apart and put it back together again. And that's how you learned how engines work. But how many technologies have the tinkering aspect of it been taken away from us? You can't really crack anything open anymore without voiding the warranty. And there's even some cars now where, you know, there's a hood over the, over the engine. And if you open that hood and try to tinker with the engine yourself, then you've just voided the warranty. So Ham radio is one of the few opportunities left where you can take technology apart and fiddle with it, learn how it works, and then gain a better understanding and appreciation of what goes into television and computers and, and cell phones. So we don't just use these things mindlessly. We think about how much effort is was put into building those towers and running the lines to those towers and the people who have to work every single day to keep these things on. Hopefully it'll it'll inspire a sense of appreciation for the hard work that people do on our behalf. I've heard as well that there, and I think you, you may have mentioned this, but people because of the low power requirements like to take their ham, some sort of equipment or whatever, like go up to the top of a mountain or go to a remote place and, and you still have the ability then to broadcast and, that is, is that is that right? Yes, there are two organizations. One's called Summits on the Air, and one's called Parks on the Air. So, Parks on the Air, people take uh, low power. It's called QRP radios, but they'll take low power radios to different national parks or state parks, and they will try to make as con many contacts with people from around the country and around the world as they can. The same thing with Summits on the Air. Uh, people will take their radios up to high mountains, 
If you have any high mountains in your state, there's probably somebody up there right now doing it. The advantage of being on a high mountain, of course, is that you have uh, much farther contacts than you would at sea level. But it's the same thing. You make as many contacts with people around the world. It might just be as simple as getting their name and location and call sign. And then you put that in a log. Um, you can get points for that. Uh, you're not earning money or anything like that, but you have the bragging rights and, uh, you know, the um, the recognition that you've made these different contacts with people all around the world. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, you would imagine how, how much fun that would be even in your home and thinking, oh, there's somebody up on this mountain right now that I've just communicated with who just climbed it and he's doing these things. And what a great sort of community building thing that is to share in that. Yeah. A couple of weeks ago, my local ham radio group went to Assateague Island, um, where the, the wild ponies are. We set up in a pavilion and we did a parks on the air activation. So we just sat there all day long giving out a specific call sign that we were using and people from, geez, we were getting people from Italy. Um, I remember a contact from England, a lot of folks in the West Coast. It was interesting. A lot of uh, Californians and Oklahomans and things like that. It was really, really neat. Plus, having it out there, we people were on the beach just doing their regular stuff, and they would walk by and say, "Oh, look, what are these guys doing? Right. You know, that's ham radio. Maybe I'll be interested in that." Mm -hmm. uh, the more we can get out among the public and show people what we're doing, the less mysterious and spooky and possibly scary ham radio is. I think a lot of people just think, uh, "Well, again, it's that thing you do in the basement," or "I don't want to mess with electricity. I don't want to get shocked." You know, it's it's so safe and, and fun. So, yeah, going back to the the wide range of ages that participate in operating ham radios, that's that harkens back to several conversations we've had about opportunities homeschoolers have to interact with that, with a wide range of people, not just people in their own peer group, and how enjoyable it is to hear from people who've been at a craft like this for a long time and, and hear their expertise on it, and also their life experience and their interests in in all kinds of ways. It seems like a good way to to make that happen. Yeah, well, like I was saying, not having a hobby is good in and of itself because it gives you something to talk about, but it also gives you something to talk about with people who aren't your own age. Um, if you're a gardener, you can talk to master gardeners and learn things from them. If you're into ham radio, um, the older people who are in ham radio are delighted when a child comes on, you know, because that means, oh, there's there's kids who are still interested in this hobby and they'll be happy to, to talk to your kids about, you know, what life was like for them or what their first radio was or how ham radio has changed in the last 30 or 40 years. It's, it's, um, it's interesting. And they don't, ex they don't treat, I found that the ham radio people we've talked to don't treat youngsters like children. They treat, they treat them like, Oh, well, you're learning about this hobby just like I was, and they treat them like peers. Sweet. It brings to mind a, a Kobe Cast episode number 105, not just for special occasions where we had a whole conversation about socialization and many of these same topics about interacting with with people of all ages and the opportunities, like I said, about uh, just going into these types of environments where our kids have opportunities to to form those skills, those socialization skills that often seem to be used. <laughs> That's like the buzzword, right? So, yeah. Yep. Um, would you say a bit, though, you've mentioned a few times about the safety of, of the medium. Would you say a little bit about that, about ways to kind of ensure safety or work toward a, a maintaining a safe environment when, when kids are interacting with others on the ham radio? Well, sure. You're, you're, working, with, um, you're working with electricity a little bit. Um, you want to make sure that you're not doing something silly like putting your antenna near a power line or um, if you're hooking up the power supply to your radio that you make sure you hook um, DC current into your radio and not AC current because you'll cook your radio. Most of these are covered in the licensing process. Um, if you want to get your license, the easiest thing to do is get the AARL, that's the American Radio Relay League handbook or technician class handbook you can get them on any place your local library or amazon through getting the the technician license um, most of the questions or at least a decent amount of the questions are about safety so we want to make sure that you're not doing something silly um, which is one of the things that parents come up to me and they say well geez is it safe am i gonna am i gonna microwave my brain no you're not um, as long as you follow some basic safety rules you're going to be fine 
Okay. And then do you, when you have been working with your son, getting him up and running as an operator, what types of conversations do you have with him about interacting with other people? Yeah, that's another thing. It's a good opportunity to practice uh, being safe. Um, hopefully that'll translate to just the world in general, but the online world. Um, the rules that I have is he's not allowed to operate by himself. You know, if he's talking to somebody, I want to be there just to make sure who he's talking to. I've never had any problems with that, but still, um, if you're concerned about it, one of the things that you can do as a parent is you can get a, a PO box. Um, your ham license is searchable. So if somebody types in your call sign into a search engine, it's an FCC database, so it's public information. Uh, if you don't mind people knowing where you live, that's fine. If you're concerned about that, you can get a P.O. box and any um, letters or cards that somebody sends will just go there and you can pick them up. So you can stay kind of anonymous that way. But again, it's a good opportunity to practice safety. Uh, we've had those conversations about, you know, don't give out your location. Don't say where you are or hey, I'm going to be home by myself for the next three days. You know, not that you would ever do that, but you know <laughs> what I mean? Like you, you're not telling anybody anything that they ought not to know. Okay. So it's a it's a good, ex that being said, I've never had any uh, bad experiences so far. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. A lot of similarities with the some of the ground we covered in episode 126, Digital Citizens about internet safety. A lot of those same principles apply. And like you said, just mm -hmm. living life and interacting with people in general in whatever in whatever medium. Yep. Okay. Okay. So uh, what's this business about St. Maximilian Colby possibly, probably being a ham radio operator? Well, this is interesting. So, you know, one of the controversies is whether he was an actual ham radio operator, but you have to remember back in the 1920s and 30s, the difference between commercial operators and ham operators was a little bit more blurry. There were a lot of experimental radio stations that were put on the air that we would probably today think of them as amateur radio operators or quasi commercial radio operators. Okay. So St. Maximilian Colby, when he was in, um, it's my understanding, when he was in uh, Japan, he sort of learned about the power of radio and mass communication. What I find fascinating is that he learned about the, the power of mass communication and then didn't run away from it. He sat down with, with his people and said, hmm, here's something that we can harness to spread the gospel. Um, and I think that's something that we should be thinking about today. It's very easy to be down on our cell phones and down on the computers and down on the internet and say, well, let's just get rid of all of it and, and just hide in our little our little shells, or we can take a different stance and say, maybe it's time for us to embrace some of these technologies and use them for good. Um, if you think about it, at the same time that St. Maximilian Colby had his amateur station on and he was using it to spread sermons and the gospel, uh, that's also the time that, unfortunately, Hitler was on the radio and he was a radio medium. He, his radio was his medium is what I'm trying to say. Um, imagine if things had gone the other way and more people were tuning into St. Maximilian Colby than the other fellow, yeah. uh, how much better the 20th century would have been. Um, so instead of running away from, from technology, he, he embraced it. Uh, he had an amateur radio call sign of SP3RN. This is in Poland. Um, it's my understanding that he built his own radio station. Um, I have information that he got his first transmitter from a used transmitter from the Wehrmacht, which I think is ha ha ha. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and again, he was using that for a while to spread the message, to spread the good news around. And I think that's that's very, very inspiring. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned before there's a net that, that meets that's named for him and and discusses him and related topics is there more to say about that yes on the hf bands um there is what's called the saint maximilian colby net it's uh every sunday night at seven o'clock it begins with a preamble uh the operator the person who runs the net begins with sharing the life and information about saint maximilian colby and where people can go to find more information about that so that in and of itself is great because somebody who's just 
scanning through the dial may say, oh, that's interesting. I'm going to find more about this person. After that, uh, the ham radio operators, we all check in and we all talk about um, our day or talk about our week, talk about, you know, going to mass, the things that we've done. Um, if anybody has any information about, about St. Maximilian Colby, maybe somebody found a picture or somebody found a, a statue or, or whatever about him, we'll share that kind of information. Um, we'll check in on each other again. So if there's an operator who might be sick um, or somebody hasn't heard from somebody in a couple of weeks, somebody, one of us might say, hey, you know, can somebody call this person and see if he's OK or she's OK? Sometimes it's just as mundane as us talking about our radios and, geez, I wasn't able to make any contacts this week because my antenna fell down or something like that. You know, does anybody have any help? And we'll share information that will help us out. But spending that time every Sunday night is uh, it's, it's good for us and it's good fellowship. And I think it's uh, a good way to remind ourselves of the of the good uses of, of amateur radio, that this isn't just something we're doing. It's, it's a service, it's, um, it's community. And we as Christians need to be doing that as much as possible, be using technology for good instead of letting it use us for not so good things. That's so interesting. So is that with the, with some of the geographical aspects of the medium, is that something that people would be able to get to using repeaters and, and other pieces of technology they add to the, or on the internet somehow, if they are not near where the, the net is located geographically? The net is specifically only on HF radio. Um, to get on HF radio, the best thing you need to do is upgrade to the second level uh, licensed class. Uh, that's a general class. My son is a general, by the way. Okay. So um, a 12-year-old kid can do it. Any kid can do it. Okay. Um, we do have people who check in all around the country, mostly from the East Coast. It's mostly based in Pennsylvania, but we have heard people from Michigan and people from uh, Wisconsin. And I know that we've had a few from the West Coast as well. Uh, depending on, of course, atmospheric conditions and propagation, you may or may not be able to hear it that week. Um, they do have another net that runs on another frequency, um, which I can't remember off the top of my head. And there's also a third way to get in touch with the St. Maximilian Colby net, um, which is another whole rabbit hole to go down. Uh, it's called DMR radio. Um, but basically, instead of a repeater just being connected, you can actually take a repeater and connect it to the internet. So you can talk into a repeater and somebody anywhere in the world who has an internet connection that goes to that repeater can have that magic voice come out on another place. And so you can have conversations with people all over the world. It's cheating a little bit because you're not exactly going radio <laughs> to radio. You're going radio to internet and then internet back out to radio, but it gets the job done. Seems like a good occasion for it. This type of, this type of meeting. <laughs> yeah. I really enjoyed your story of how you came to Colby Academy Seems like St. Maximilian Colby had something to do with that, with the timing. And what was it like when you landed on the name of, of our school and you and you discovered that connection? What was that like? Well, like I said, we were hemming and hawing about, about homeschooling and we were just really kind of worried about it. And then uh, just happened to show up in a search engine or okay. something. We're like, hmm, let's think about homeschools. Let's think about what kind of homeschool do we want? Well, we want something that um, we don't necessarily want to, not, not that there's anything wrong with it, but we don't want a secular homeschool. We'd like to have a Catholic homeschool. Oh, look at this, Colby Academy. Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, St. Maximilian Colby. Hmm. Hello. You know, somebody is looking out for <laughs> right. you, I think. Definitely. <laughs> okay. Do you have any other thoughts or stories of St. Maximilian Colby and the, and the radio medium that you want to share at this point? No, I think the main point I was trying to make is that he, what I was trying to say before, I've, I've been thinking an awful lot about how we as Christians, again, have to deal with um, with technology. There's two, there's two mistakes you can make. Mistake number one is to just adopt everything and not pay attention to what's going on. And then, you know, you have Twitter. Um, <laughs> the other mistake is to 
completely pigeonhole your or or wrap the world around you and not let your children have any contact with any technology at all, which is also probably not a good idea. All things in moderation, as Aristotle said. So again, um, my ideal behind having, especially homeschoolers get into um, amateur radio is that they can master a medium rather than be mastered by a medium. And hopefully that will translate to everything else. When they, if they're interested in computers, they'll be able to tinker behind the scenes and figure out why these things work the way they work. Or, um, you know, if they're into technology or television or anything else, they can get behind the scenes a little bit and know how these services are being delivered and how they're working for them and a appreciate them more and b not be servant to them make the medium your servant rather than being the servant of the medium i love all of these things but i mean i love how both the you know from our faith standpoint and seeing kind of how important these things were to saint maximilian colby who often we just go to his death, not yes. all the wonderful things he was doing during his life as well. But also, like you're saying, I just love that idea of of giving a concrete example of how you can kind of unpack technology and actually understand what's going on to some extent. Because I, like you say, I think it's, it's absolutely true that things are just so complex today. You know, I always think about this from a classical learning standpoint in, in like modern physics, for example. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't, I can't really have true knowledge about most of the principles of physics because I can't do the math. And I, even if I were to try to read a report, I can't really verify whether that experiment really happened the way they said it did or whatever, or even understand enough to know, have an opinion about it. So those are areas where I just have to trust the scientific community to some extent, to the principles that I have. But there still are things like ham radio where you can get down and understand the principles and verify the principles and see this is this is the application. So that's I love that. I love that. Yeah. And again, if you don't understand the principles, then it has a practical outcome, bad outcome for you. I can't hear anybody. Why not? Well, because my antenna is not exactly the right length for the frequency I'm broadcasting on. It's a basically a, a a game of setting up problems for yourself to solve. You know, yeah. hmm, how can I how can I make more? How can I have more people talk to talk to? How can I hear farther? How can I um, how can I get more power out of this little radio? What can I do to fix these little problems? So you give yourself these little problems and you and you make solutions for them, but you learn in a very practical way why wavelength is important or why the position of the sun or why the you know the time of day that you're broadcasting is important yeah that, i'm going to go down rabbit holes after this to to look at like the ionosphere and things and start thinking about some some of the aspects of that that i haven't been thinking about for a very long time and my friend was just mentioning that somebody who was talking to was trying to connect to somebody, somebody a long way away, and he just couldn't do it. So he ended up adjusting his 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 antenna in some way, and then he was able to get it. But he said, essentially, what he thought was that he was trying to make the closer connection, but he ended up having to make kind of a round connection or something like that. Which it's like I would never even think of that. You know, it's a, it's a great you know, concrete things to have to try to figure out and then go and think about, well, why was that happening this night or what, what's going on? And just really fun. It definitely seems to have a lot of appeal for people who are mechanically inclined and also want to understand deeply, want, want to understand why things work, how they work. It seems just right up the alley for those who are inclined that way. Exactly. I'm also really struck by same X million Colby, how the medium was at new, it's cutting edge at the time that he made use of that in his time and how it has endured up to the present day and and exists alongside our newer technologies and has its own place and usefulness and um also interacts with with our newer things, but also it holds its own. Yeah. 
as a kid growing up, um, I used to listen to a lot of AM radio at night just because it was fun to be under the covers and hear a station from Chicago or a station from Toronto or whatever. Yeah. Um, my parents had a shortwave radio growing up. Um, even if you don't want to get into all of amateur radio, I do recommend for parents investing in a nice shortwave radio. Um, you can learn a lot of the same principles. You're not transmitting, you're just listening, but you can figure out why is it I can hear a station in Africa or a station in Australia or a station in Poland. It's, it's a lot of fun that way. Through having a, a shortwave radio, you can learn about um, different cultures. If you're practicing French or Spanish, what better way to practice it than to hear it on the radio from somebody? Yeah. But back to the nostalgia, when I was growing up, I had that shortwave radio. And I remember at night listening to the stations from around the world and just being fascinated that they were out there and they were broadcasting. And gosh, someday I want to go to, I want to go to England. Someday I want to go to France. Someday I want to travel to Australia. I can hear these signals and these people are fascinating you know mm. there unfortunately there's not as much on shortwave as there used to be uh, most of the shortwave stations have shut down but there are still plenty of uh, things the vatican still broadcasts on shortwave so you can hear that right well you are pretty convincing what are the next steps for listeners who'd like to set up their own radio shacks and try their hands at this medium any must do's Sure. Well, again, I encourage homeschooling families to do this as a family. Uh, if you have a student who's interested in it, that's great. Um, if there's a mom or a dad who wants to do it or an older brother or an older sister to do it as well, the opportunities for learning will be a lot easier if you do this together as a, as a family. Okay. The best first step to do is to go out and get the uh, amateur technician licensing book from the ARRL. Um, I don't remember exactly how much it is, but it's not terribly expensive. You can use that book as a textbook, by the way. It has all the things you need to learn for the tests. It explains all the basic principles, and it's pretty readable. Um, younger students may have, you have to walk them through a little bit older, but uh, middle schoolers and high schools, I think, can probably do it on their own. Just read through it and take the practice test. Uh, there are plenty of spaces online for um, taking practice tests. You can just take them over and over and over again until you start passing them, the more than failing them. You will have to go find a uh, amateur radio group wherever you are. Most of them will give out the tests. Uh, if you can't find that information, uh, search online for your local ham radio group, your local amateur radio group, call them. Uh, you may want to go to a meeting and just meet the people and say, hey, I've got a 12-year-old at home who's really interested in amateur radio. They'll be delighted. Yeah. They'll bend over backwards to get this person into the hobby. Um, and they will tell you how to take the test. The test is not free anymore. Um, well, depends on who gives it. The test might be about $15. The license is a little bit more of a tricky process because you actually have to go to the FCC website, fill out some forms then you have to uh, send in payment for a license. It's not horrible. It's, uh, I forget how much it is. They keep changing it, but it's under a hundred dollars. It's not horrible. So that's the first steps. Once you do that, then you know, you're know you down a number of rabbit holes. Which radio should I buy? What's the best radio to buy? And all sorts of stuff. There is plenty of information on YouTube um, about if you just go to YouTube and type beginner ham radio, you will find all sorts of great uh, websites or great channels. Parents, please preview everything before you watch it with your kids. Some amateur radio things are better than others. Uh, I recommend a guy called Ham Radio uh, Crash Course. Um, they're pretty decent. Okay. But again, I wouldn't watch anything on YouTube without watching it first before showing it to your kids if they're interested in it as well. Yeah. This is the golden age of ham radio for youth, I think. Uh, there are plenty of groups for youngsters in ham radio. There's one called Youth on the Air. You can look that up. Um, they have an organization for young people to join, but they also have a summer camp that happens every couple of years. And um, the kids can go to that camp for a week. The last one was in Ohio. They can learn all about uh, amateur radio communications, they'll build their own radios, they'll um, make satellite contacts, they'll do all sorts of really neat things there. Um, there's another really great youth group called the Young Amateur uh, 
young amateur communication ham team. They meet every night at eight o'clock. Uh, my son's been doing that. And again, it's good practice on how to talk to other people, how to take turns, how to use your call sign and pay attention to what other people are learning. The kids in that group are amazing because they're always uh, coming up with new ways of doing things and they'll make their own little websites and they'll talk about their other hobbies. It doesn't have to be the only hobby your son or daughter is into. You know, a lot of these kids are also into computers and they're also into 3D printing or drones and RV cars and things like that. So it's a hobby that can grow along with other hobbies as well. One of the other organizations to check out is an outfit called the Long Island CW. CW is ham radio for Morse code. The Long Island CW Club. They have an online, it's through Zoom, but they have an online class where youngsters can learn Morse code, which is another one of those rabbit holes you can go down. Um, but it's a fun thing to know just because it's kind of cool to know, to know Morse code. But in many cases, Morse code, the dits and dahs, the dit dit, da da da, dit dit stuff is the most effective way to make communications, particularly when uh, conditions aren't so great, when it's really, really super noisy. You might not be able to hear somebody talk, but you can hear the little beeps coming through. So there are so many opportunities for youngsters in amateur radio that I think this is a perfect time for um for homeschoolers to do it sure sounds like it i would be remiss if i didn't mention episode 100 of the colby cast with uh, one of our founders mrs diane muth telling their story of the founding of colby academy and at the end of that episode we replay a very short early colby cast episode my sister hope and i talking about saint maximilian colby and saint ignatius of loyola so there's that for a little bit more about saint maximilian colby we also, I, I hear you use the word tinker repeatedly. I, that is such a fabulous word. And we actually have a Colby cast episode with that word in the title. It's a, Col a mom, a Colby mom, Louise deal. The episode is called let them tinker episode 42. A, a lot of discussion about STEM topics and homeschool and how that family, a Colby family made use of the Colby curriculum and also explored a lot of um, STEM interests that they had. So we'll, we'll include all these links in our show notes for listeners to check these out and lots of different directions to go from here. What a fascinating conversation. Are there any final thoughts or takeaways you want to leave with our listeners? I just want to encourage folks to explore amateur radio. It can be intimidating, I think. Well, geez, I'm not very good at science and I'm not very good at math. Don't let that hold you back. You don't have to be MacGyver. You don't have to be, um, you know, a math and science whiz. Um, you just have to have a passion for wanting to know how things work. And like I said before, this is a good, safe way to learn how things work. Super. So the St. Max net that you've been telling us about, what's the address for that? The website is, it's all one word, stmaxnet.org.org. Okay, that'll be in our among the links in our notes, so check those out. Chris, this has been great. How does one sign off when wrapping up a conversation via ham radio? Well, you know, that's a funny thing. Um, in ham radio world, whether we're talking or doing Morse code, we don't just say goodbye or see you later. We have this funny little expression. Um, we use the letters or the numbers 73. It's a bit of a mystery where that came from. Nobody knows. If you look it up on Google, you'll find 20 different explanations of what that is and what it means. Um, and I'm not sure which one is the correct one, but it's just standard fare that when you're done talking to somebody, you say 73. It means best wishes or, you know, have a nice day or something pleasant like that. So 73. I love it. That's great. Thank you again for coming. You're welcome. Thank you. If you're a Colby family and are intrigued by ham radio, email us at podcast at colby.org to let us know. If we can get enough interest, we'll see if we can get people together to find out more about this hobby. Oh, and 73. Mary, our mother, pray for us. St. Maximilian Colby, pray for us. Ad maiorem Dei Gloriam. <laughs>